just uh, wave and I'll, I'll speak even louder. Um, and I think we also have Mark Mallory uh, on, online. Uh, really? I'm, I don't think Jen is, is with us, but uh, hi to everyone. And if there are other co-authors, um, don't hesitate to speak up. Um, we are, we're talking about this microplastic uh, paper, which I'll present briefly before we start uh, chatting. And uh, as you know, plastic ingestion is, is one of the hottest themes in seabed research at the moment. And it's interesting to, to wonder why. Uh, I'm sure that today's guest uh, will have a, an opinion in this matter, but here are a few thoughts. Seabed researchers have been long aware that marine plastics um, are a problem, at least since the mid 80s or maybe even earlier as Joanna maybe will tell us. And uh, plastic research built up gradually across the decades Yet it was only one among other research themes in our little seabird world. But then came the BBC with uh, documentaries on plastics in the oceans that shook uh, public opinion worldwide. This demonstrated once more the, the power of visual arts in uh, nature conservation. As a consequence of this uh, massive media exposure, marine plastics uh, research literally exploded in recent years. And in the Arctic, much of the work has been led by uh, Jennifer Provencher from uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada in Ottawa. Um, in 2018, Jennifer led a paper in Science of a Total Environment, uh, which indicated that seabirds may poop a lot of microplastics at their breeding colonies, therefore transporting the stuff from sea to land. The paper we discuss today pushes this research further. Uh, it's a collaboration between Carleton University, to which Madeleine is affiliated, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Acadia University. This is where Mark Mallory is, is based. And, and the work, as we said, is um, led by uh, Madeleine Bourdage. The, the researchers worked together with Inuit hunters from Nunavut uh, to uh, gather northern fulmers and thick builders on Baffin Island. They dissected the birds and looked for microplastics. So that's the, the plastic particles, which are smaller than five uh, millimeters. In the, first, they look in the proximal section of a gastrointestinal tract. Uh, in short, everything around the stomach and the first part of the intestines. But they also looked at the very end of the uh, tubing system, uh, the, the small intestine and the cloaca. They call the second part the fecal uh, precursor sample. Uh, that's a difficult term, so uh, I propose that we just call it wannabe poop. So wannabe poop is what you will find in the small intestine and the cloaca, okay? After the dissections, uh, all suspected uh, plastic particles were chemically identified using spectroscopy. Um, Madeleine and her colleagues found microplastics in 74% of the fulmers gastrointestinal tracts and in 56% of their wannabe poop samples. In thick bill mirrors, uh, results were a bit more surprising as uh, the researchers found no microplastics in the ga gastrointestinal tracts, but uh, those were present in 17% of the wannabe poop samples. On, on the basis of this uh, information, our Canadian colleagues estimated how much microplastics the seabirds were pooping into their breeding colonies each, um, each summer. <clears throat> they came up with 3.3 uh, million particles uh, for the former colony and 45.5 uh, million particles yearly for the mer colony. And that's because uh, there are many more birds on that mer colony than on the former colony. Uh, these figures may seem a, a lot, but um, in, in the discussion of the paper, the authors stress that uh, probably there are many, many more microplastic uh, particles which are dropped off uh, at high Arctic sites through atmospheric circulation than through seabirds. Uh, so congratulations, Madeleine, on, on this and, and uh, the team on uh, this uh, very nice uh, paper. And uh, we, we're happy to, to have you around um, for this last session of, of the year. And um, I, I, have, I have a few questions before we, we open uh, for a general discussion. And I, I was wondering, uh, because I, I know that seabirds, in the seabird stomach, really the, uh, the pylorus, so what connects the seabird stomach to the intestine is a very, very narrow 
uh, structure. And I was wondering, uh, do you have an idea also through the dissections of the minimum size of uh, particles which can transfer from the stomach into the in intestine? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, so I didn't actually do the, the stomach dissections. That was led by Julia Bach um, and Mark Mallory, Mallory. So Mark might be able to comment more on that. Um, yeah, offhand, I don't, I don't have an answer for what's being passed, okay. then, but maybe Mark can add that. He just muted. Yeah, hi folks. Um, I don't, I, I actually don't have an answer. I, I, I think that um, we find very small particles can move through, but sometimes surprisingly larger ones can move through as well. I think in general, <clears throat> that, that seems to be, you know, the, uh, the, the, the rationale for why some pieces are, are retained and some not, that you've got that very small junction, but it, it certainly seems to be flexible and under some cases, larger materials can move through. So it, um, it presents a bit of a challenge, I think, because it, it, it's a restriction, but, it, but it's not a, a hard and fast uh, diameter that suddenly you can say, okay, stuff smaller or larger than this doesn't get through this, because I think it can under different situations. So it's, um, it, it's a bit of a challenge that way, I think. No, it's really interesting because I, I had this perception that, you know, only liquid uh, was, was going through. So uh, that's, that's certainly very interesting. And I was wondering whether um, these uh, anatomical features and, and differences between the, the MERS and the full MERS may explain why you found no microplastics in, in the MER uh, ga gastrointestinal tract. Oh, sorry, is that for me or Madeline? I was going to let Madeline go on that. Either, either, <laughs> either, either, either way. <laughs> I hope you heard uh, me okay. Yeah, um, well, I think we sort of looked at the differences between what was found in the Fulmers and the MERS with their, their feeding habits. So, um, you know, the Fulmers are typically eating at the surface of the water, whereas the MERS are pursued or diver diving birds. Um, so most plastics aren't typically neutrally buoyant. They're not found as much in the water column as they are on the surface. So that's sort of, you know, what we figured attributed to the, the presence of plastics in their stomachs. Um, you know, the question of microplastics though, is also, they may not be retaining or be retained at all in the stomach. So these, a lot of these particles could just be moving through the bird systems, you know, and being excreted out. And that might explain why we found particles in the mer um, wannabe poop samples um, and not in the, in the stomachs. You know, if they're not ingesting the large plastics, but they're ingesting, you know, maybe prey items that have small particles in them or, um, just particles from the water as well. Yeah, right, I'll, I'll just add there that uh, Madeline also has another paper out on seals and uh, like the MERS, I think you found no plastics in the seals, right, Madeline? Which yeah. is another Arctic diving forager, right? So it was, it was kind of interesting that the, the, uh, the ring seals and the MERS had this similar pattern. Undoubtedly, they're both getting microplastics, but they seem to move through those organisms quite easily, whereas the fulmars and to some extent kittiwakes retain them a little more. Well, that's, that's really interesting because in a recent uh, Seabird session, we, um, we talked about digestion and, and digestive plasticity and this idea that um, depending on the availability of uh, food resources, you know, the uh, seabirds are capable of um, um, digesting much faster or, or slower. Uh, and, and of course, you know, this may also affect how quickly these particles will uh, come through. Uh, and, I, and I saw also in the discussion and the calculations on how many particles uh, the, the birds drop off at the colony uh, that, that you took an average number of particles per pooping event. Uh, but, but actually, you know, you could have this idea that uh, the density of, of particles won't be always the same, you know, in the poop sample. You know, you could have a, a quick poop at the beginning with uh, a lot of plastics going through. Um, and, and, then, uh, and then the rest with fewer plastics. So uh, 
So I, I see all this as, as also being very, uh, very dynamic. Yeah, totally agree, David. And, and uh, um, maybe just, just a, a detail before um, we, we ask the audience, but do you, you write in the papers uh, about uh, gizzards in the MERS. Uh, do, do they really have the gizzards? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they, they do. My recollection is they do. It's just, uh, it's definitely smaller and, and uh, different shape, but uh, they still have that, um, that, that, Hard, uh, hard muscle filled with uh, with some grit and that for grinding down, you know, fish bones and scales and whatever else they're taking in principally. I think. Ah, okay. Now that's that's interesting because you know in penguins there's all, always this uh, this idea that you know they have gizzards, uh, but actually if you if you really look and do dis dissections, um, uh, at least Pygoscelis penguins, they they don't have a gizzard. You know, it's floating around in, in the literature, but it's something that doesn't really uh, doesn't really exist. Um, huh. yeah, Grant and Mariana, do you uh, do you have questions? I, I still have one, but uh, I, I can ask it also later. Yeah, you 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 kind of actually hit the question that I was going to ask. So thanks for that, David. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I know that's fine. I'll survive. Um, I did. I was curious. Um, so I guess microplastics. If the, if a lot of this is passing through. Um, species, the, some of the diving species, then you wouldn't, it's probably not much of a conservation concern for those, those diving birds. But what about for, I don't know if there's been any work done on say storm petrels or any of the other procellariforms looking at this. Um, do you reckon that there's any, any sense that microplastics might be a cause for concern towards mortality of these birds? Well, I don't, yeah, for mortality, I don't, I don't know if there's really any of much evidence for that. Um, but we don't know a lot of what the effects of microplastic ingestion are still. Um, so any kind of toxicological effects, that's still something that a lot of people are working on um, to try to understand. But as far as mortality, because the particles are so small, I don't think there's much evidence for that. But but potential harm from chemicals absorbing onto the particles or being released from the particles themselves. Yeah. That's still something that people are looking into. Yeah. Do you have any, any idea of how, what the, I guess it's probably difficult to quantify and I don't think, I don't know if there's been any work done on this at all, but is there been, has there been any work done looking at the distribution of microplastics in the Arctic from a sense of like, looking at the patchiness of different types of microplastics and could that be and could that be a reason why there's differences between this the the, the myrrh and um, the samples you're getting from myrrh and full in full myrrh yeah um so there there hasn't been a lot of work yet in the i mean in the canadian arctic i'll say but um yeah more and more studies are starting to look at microplastics in, in environmental samples um, so I, yeah, I think there's still a lot, a large gap in what we know about where microplastics are exactly in the Arctic or what the main sources are and et cetera. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you could, you could vocalize a little bit more on, on the, the types of plastics that you found. I'm seeing here that you've, you've seen like a lot of different types of fibers. Now are these fibers, things that could be like from washing your clothes, or is this, uh, is it breakdown of larger plastics? Um, but just curious as to what what the what those kinds of materials come from. Yeah, um, you know it's really hard to pinpoint exactly where a microplastic particle originated from, or what was the you know the item that it broke away from. Um, but from what we found, yeah, a lot of fibers that could be from you know, different types of clothing, different um, fishing material as well. Um, I know in, in Julia's paper, they found thread, which looked more sort of fishing related. Um, but yeah, for the, for the small fibers that we found in the, the wannabe, wannabe poop samples, um, you know, it is very hard to identify what that actually came from. We do, are, we are able to identify what the, or in most cases, what the 
the polymer type was. So that kind of helps, you know, identify what what it could have come from. But um, as we as you know, um, people are becoming more and more aware. A lot of what we wear is different types of plastic. So um, yeah. you know, we some of the fibers in our clothing are the same fibers in you know, other textiles and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I, I guess the, the sort of comes from this, you know, looking at figure two, where you've got sort of the shapes and colors of the various things that you had collected. Um, there's seems to be quite a prevalence of blue material, um, you know, over 58, over 50 percent in both both species, which is quite interesting. And I, I mean, I assume that blue is, isn't just something that accumulates in the environment or that they're particularly attracted to the color blue when it's floating in the water. Um, you know, especially if, you know, assuming these are micro, they, they can't see these things when they're, when they're eating them, they're already in the, the guts of the animals they're eating. Um, but it is interesting that there's this yeah, prevalence of the color blue for some reason. Yeah, and a lot of studies have have sort of identified or mentioned that blue seems to be a very common plastic that's found um, mm. in all kinds of environmental samples. So water, sediment. Right. You know, that, um, so so uh, blue is just a color, it's just a material, that, the color of a material that's just sort of ubiquitously out there. More yeah, I, I, I think there's, yeah, I, I don't know for sure why, um, <laughs> but I, I guess there's a lot of blue material, blue. <laughs> No. Yeah, in, uh, in no. yeah, in planktivorous uh, uh, species, there's this idea um, that uh, the, the, the bird um, may mistake the particles uh, for zooplankta, and, and hence, you know, that, that may explain why darker particles are, are favored. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I have no idea whether, I, well, I don't think this will have a, an incidence in fullness, and, and I don't know whether, you know, this may have one in MERS. Yeah. Interesting. I was uh, wondering about the white, because I was wondering also about the colors. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so why, why the white then in, uh, in, the, in the MERS? I mean, I, I have no idea. Maybe there is no, uh, no explanation to, to this again. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, for, for the sizes that we were finding in in the pre poop samples, I don't. Yeah, I think they were just particles that were accidentally ingested, and you know they. I don't think there's uh, any known reason why you know there are so, uh, some colors versus others, aside from maybe they're more prevalent in the environment. But. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite interesting. So what, I guess, uh, Mariana, do you have any more questions for Madeline? Yes, just uh, one uh, one more question. So I was also very, um, um, it was very interesting to uh, to look at the differences between the full Mars and uh, the full Mars and the Mer. And uh, I was uh, wondering uh, if uh, um, there is uh, any any more work done on other uh, oak species uh, in the um, in the Arctic and um, it, if like based on the foraging ecology, then you could um, sort of uh, pinpoint which uh, other species might behave more like might have the same results, let's say similar results as the, the full mark. Yeah, um, Mark might be able to add more to this there. You know, other birds have been looked at for uh, plastic ingestion to at this point. Um, there hasn't been a lot of studies looking at what particles are being excreted by birds, but it would be definitely interesting to compare this with with more um, or different <laughs> birds and see if you know, if our results compare at all. With that, Mark, do you you might have more to add? Well, just to add sort of specific to the Canadian Arctic, at least. Um, the only ox we have, and what we would call the Arctic, are the thick-billed murres. We we get the odd razorbill sneaks up into the low Arctic in Canada, and depending on whether you call Labrador and Newfoundland Arctic or not, um, you know, of course, once you get down to the Gannet Islands, which according to CAF is still Arctic, but, but um, you know, it's balmy compared to where Madeline's study took place. Uh, but, uh, 
so of course you've got four species of ox there, but but really up in, in most of what we would call the above the tree line Arctic. Um, in Canada, you just have the one, so you don't have a good comparison. You'd have to go over to West Greenland, maybe Southwest Greenland, where you also have some, I believe, uh, common murs and razorbills, I think both there to, to have some sort of comparison to see if, and, and of course you've got uh, little ox all through West Greenland, but uh, I think they're most, they're separated. So I think they're most in Northwest Greenland, um, at least for breeding. Uh, you'd have to go down there to do a comparative study or head out somewhere else like Svalbard or, or somewhere where they have multiple species to look within that same functional group, whether you get differences, which would be a great study. I, I think that'd be really interesting to follow up on. And David, uh, for all I know, David may, may be doing some of this already, I'm not too sure. I, yeah, I, will, I put in the chat uh, uh, reference of uh, when, uh, the, the one paper we, we did on, on microplastics, but uh, I agree with Mark that you know, the, the best uh, site uh, to do a multi-species analysis uh, would be uh, where our Danish colleagues work in Southwest Greenland. If, if you wanted to have um, <laughs> several, uh, several species of, uh, of alcids. Um, that um, there were very nice uh, studies uh, during the PhD of Jan uh, uh, Lineberg um, on, on the uh, the MER for uh, the, well acid foraging ecology at this site, but I, I have no idea whether you know they have the samples to look at the microplastics. Yeah, it, it's a good question, and in theory, depending on what community you go to, you might even be able to do that just by going to the local markets, assuming it's still inside the bird. Uh, you right. have to go to the local yeah. markets and just simply buy the different species and do it right. So it, it actually would be very doable if someone is there is itching for something to do. Yeah. Um, that would be a very doable study. Just buying it would, be, it would actually be kind of cheap. <laughs> just go buy. It. <laughs> no, that's uh, yeah, that's how um, many dietary studies uh, were were done in Greenland. Yeah. yeah. And, and so uh, what's the, the next step, actually? And, and uh, did, did people um, actually look directly in the Buono for, for microplastics? Uh, because I, I was thinking while reading the paper, you know, did, uh, did you start to work on the birds because people looked at, uh, at the Guano and found particles? Yeah, we kind of wanted to um, sort of take the paper by and Provencher in 2018 and look more at what, so we know that these birds, or we know that fulmars, or we knew that fulmars were excreting plastics, but what does that mean for the colonies? How many particles could be deposited around the colonies? Um, there's another paper in the works right now that look, looked at water and se sediment samples around the fulmar colony that we, we looked at um, as well to see if if the particles in the environment were comparable to those found in the the birds um, yeah so just looking to see if if seabirds could be or are an important source of microplastics in the arctic especially since they they breed in such large numbers at these colonies, you know, is, is their guano an important source of localized plastic pollution in the Arctic? Yeah, um, and, and then uh, I guess you could, uh, you could look also in other places of the world where guano actually accumulates. Um, and, and we discussed this a lot in, in previous sessions of, of course, you know, in, in other parts where it accumulates well, you have these meter high walls of, of guano you can dig into and then reconstruct uh, for what period you still <coughs> find you still find microplastics and and when or, or when you know it starts to uh, to be there uh, but i guess you know the the arctic is probably less uh, a less qualified um, region to do this sort of things because guano doesn't accumulate that much Yeah, uh, I agree with that. Um, and Madeline's right. I think Bonnie has a paper coming out. Um, one of the interesting things in Bonnie's paper that's coming out is a lot of the uh, tiny plastics were uh, were paint chips, which is a little different. Uh, we, there were definitely some differences off of mostly we think off of ships, right? Mm. Ice and all that sort of stuff. And so you get these uh, micro particles, uh, yeah, uh, micro particles in um, in the water. And there were some differences between what the birds had versus what uh, what was in the environment. Um, and the other thing that, uh, if I recall correctly, I may be confusing them here, uh, Madeline, but 
Um, one of the things that, that we kind of thought was notable here is that this is in an area where there's actually very comparatively little fisheries, right? So a lot of the microplastics, we didn't necessarily think were coming from broken up fishing material, um, which is so prevalent elsewhere in the world, but the Arctic is one of the spots where it's not really that prevalent, and yet you're still getting <laughs> loads of microplastics from other stuff. So that, that to me was kind of an interesting uh, comparison. And again, we've got a, with Jen, we've got another uh, uh, thing that's in the works. We've done some beach surveys along there, and again, on the beach surveys, when you go right up to the high Arctic, uh, once you get past Newfoundland and Labrador, the, the fishing component of beach uh, um, mesoplastics, at least, and down to the larger microplastics, uh, really is not much in the way of fishing material like it is everywhere else. Kind of interesting. Hmm. Okay, cool. Oh, and sorry, uh, the last thing I'll mention here, folks, is Jen Provence. She just texted me. She's stuck on another call with uh, with someone senior to her, so she apologizes. <laughs> she planned to be here, but she just can't get off the phone. Uh, sorry. Yeah, we, 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 we're taking a very good note of uh, for <laughs> not being sufficiently important and then we'll remind Jen, uh, of course, immediately to try to get free BS on the next occasion. Yeah, sure. This is even in recording, uh, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> is, it's set in stone now. Um, do we have any questions from the audience while we're here? I don't see anybody raising their hands. David, if you don't have anything else, I think we can probably move on to our next paper. No, uh, well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot to, uh, to the authors for being with us uh, during the festive season. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks you, Madeline. Thank, thank you. you, Mark. Nice to see you. All right, uh, Mariana, you're up. Yes. And I think we've got Celine with us. Right. Hello, Celine, bonjour, how are you? Hi. Nice Hi, Celine. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so for I hope you will hear me. If uh, if I drop, I will try to to call uh, to call back. But anyway, for this uh, paper, uh, which is uh, led by uh, by Celine Albert, uh, we have actually a big uh, multi author paper, which has uh, put uh, uh, together a, a data set that goes across uh, the Arctic and uh, uh, sub uh, sub Arctic. And uh, with this, uh, uh, in this paper, the authors focus on mercury concentration in Arctic seabirds. And uh, the authors make the case that knowledge um, uh, about mercury concentration is restricted mostly to the breeding period and little is known about the non-breeding period. So we know that uh, most uh, Arctic seabirds uh, leave their breeding site and migrate uh, um, in particular to southern, uh, to, towards the southern areas where conditions and also um, mercury concentration might differ uh, differ from uh, those encountered at the breeding areas. Uh, for example, it was uh, uh, shown that uh, in little oaks, um, little oaks had a higher mercury concentration during the non-breeding period that was spent uh, in, uh, uh, in the east of Newfoundland compared to uh, the breeding period, which uh, was uh, in uh, East Greenland. And this uh, negatively impacted their uh, subsequent reproduction. So uh, the authors collected the body and the head uh, feathers to investigate the seasonal, spatial, and uh, interspecific variation in mercury concentration. And uh, based on the known foraging ecology and the previous documented pattern of mercury exposure, they predict the higher mercury concentration in uh, head feathers which are an indication of the non-breeding period of the exposure during the non-breeding period and in uh, um, compared to uh, body feathers uh, which are an indication of the exposure during the breeding periods and in particular they predicted a higher mercury concentration in uh, the western atlantic compared to other regions and the regions that were looked at were the, the Atlantic, so which was dividing in west and east atlantic and then also the uh, pacific so um, body feathers and the head feathers were collected during the breeding period from several uh, from several species, uh, from ancient murlets, branch guillemots, common guillemots, crested oaklets, list oaklets, little oaks, razorbills, and uh, um, rhinoceros um, oaklets, and tuft puffins. And so uh, we had a wide, uh, a big, uh, a big data set across 28 breeding colonies um, um, from the North Atlantic to the North Pacific uh, and from the subarctic to the high Arctic um, and the collection the collection period was between 2015 and 2017. 
So I also have to say that I think that uh, um, uh, I helped uh, collecting uh, the, uh, these uh, some sample, subsequent samples. <laughs> You know, because when I was in, when I actually was in in Greenland with uh, with Yanni and uh, and Martin, they were collecting feathers. So I think <laughs> that these feathers uh, will go into um, into into data set into into, into common uh, data set. So it was it was very nice to actually uh, read this uh, read read this paper. So. Um, the authors found that uh, uh, Mercury concentrations uh, uh, during the non-breeding uh, period were three times higher than during the breeding period. Uh, um, the Mercury concentration during the non-breeding period were nine times and three times higher uh, than during the breeding periods for West and East Greenland. But then for the Pacific area, um, the, uh, we found that we had a different, uh, a different results. So the concentration, the mercury concentration during the non-breeding period uh, were only 1.7 times higher than during the breeding period. So, uh, but Celine, so you, um, you also, so you found these differences between these three areas and also less um, less of a difference, less of a seasonal um, uh, difference in the in the Pacific, but also uh, for the Pacific, for the species that you looked at the, in the in the Pacific, uh, you did not, uh, you saw low or also no no seasonal uh, no seasonal variation, and I was wondering uh, why um, the the case of the of the Pacific being different to the Atlantic. Um. Some of our hypothesis is that um, the mercury input might be for different between the two regions, for instance, or, or, or because the, maybe the species were not migrating the same. Because mm -hmm. one of our big hypotheses for the, the Atlantic is that um, the migration between breeding and non-breeding time uh, impacts their uh, differences in mercury concentrations. Um, and also, when we look at uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic, um, we also worked on, no on another paper with uh, Marina Renedo, who looked at uh, the isotope of mercury, and she also pointed out in her paper that there might be some uh, differences in the dynamic of these two parts of the Arctic that might explain mm. the differences in concentrations. Um, and more specifically for the Pacific, um, I remember that uh, I was a little bit surprised when I saw the, 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 first, uh, the first results because I was not expecting uh, that. Um, and um, and also because um, for the uh, migration of the Pacific in the Pacific parts, uh, at the beginning I mostly related on the knowledge that we have uh, regarding books and few papers that we have on migration on 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 these parts, um, and. Um, um, and I, I lost the idea I had in mind, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No, I was also wondering if uh, there is also some uh, uh, diet uh, component. We will get back to the story of, of the migration because I actually really liked uh, um, the way you also then discussed um, also the differences between the different uh, regions. Mm -hmm. But because then when you talk about the guillemots, because we know a lot about the diet of the guillemots uh, and of um, of anyway other species rather than also like your full set of uh, of species um, I don't know I was also just wondering if there is also a a, um, um, a a reason to be found in the type of of diet or not I um, I I don't know uh, I, I'm I'm not sure because that was one of the uh, of the thing that we looked at uh, if. In the literature, mostly, if the diet could play a role. But if I am not wrong, I think it's for the um, just 
the, 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 just to make sure I don't say uh, the, rhinoc the rhinoceros outlet, for instance. Um, we were a little bit surprised because uh, it's one of the species in the Pacific that, high, that had the highest mercury concentrations in winter. But for what we are reading in the literature, they actually feed. Uh, I think they feed on lower trophic level than compared to the breeding period. So we had some surprises, but it's also the same for Brunish guillemots, for, inst for instance, on the, on the Atlantic uh, parts. Um, but um, yeah, um, the thing is that for the Pacific birds, I was really lucky and happy to have all of the colleagues from the Pacific parts because I mostly know the birds from, from the Atlantic and they helped us a lot uh, in terms of uh, bibliography also for the diet of, of these birds. Um, and now at the end, I think that one big thing of this paper is that the diets cannot explain alone this, uh, this huge variations that we can see and lower in the Pacific, but, um, but uh, no, the diets alone cannot explain. Uh, yeah. If regarding so, uh, we, if we get back to the to the line that you were following about the the migration, so when you mm -hmm. because you saw also these spatial differences between uh, within and uh, within the Atlantic, and then also as we say the between the, the Atlantic and the um, and the, and the Pacific, and then you start to um, um, to make calls uh, basically for uh, more data uh, for integrating basically this data set with other. Um, with other data set and the importance basically of knowing uh, what is happening basically in the wintering um, in the in the numbering during the numbering period and basically so in the windy wintering um, area so um, I sort of, uh, um, I'm thinking as uh, like a seabirds that are contributing to the movement basically of the of the contaminants and so um, I was wondering, so which, uh, if you can first say which uh, type of data, then uh, you would uh, uh, integrate with which type of data you would integrate the data set that you that you got now. In terms of winter distribution, you mean? Yes. yes. Yeah. So actually, my PhD, uh, the focus, the main focus of my PhD was to look at spatial ecotoxicology. So this study, but also papers. Uh, for uh, we also have studies on which we mix both uh, mercury in feathers and GLS data. Hmm. So we collaborate uh, for this part of my PhD. We collaborated with uh, Citrac, the Norwegian program that equip that equips seabirds with uh, GLS to know where the birds are going during uh, during winter. Um, and so we are working with them to. Uh, to look where the birds are going and, and if we have um, a hotspot of mercury concentrations uh, on at least on the uh, in the Atlantic, Atlantic parts. And uh, are you also looking at the um, like uh, at the proportion basically of individuals uh, uh, from each uh, uh, breeding site that then goes uh, into different uh, uh, wintering areas? So then that would then start uh, explaining the um, the variation basically in the mercury concentration that you also see like uh, between individuals but also between sites uh, variation. Yeah, that's something I would I would like to work on. It will not be part of my PhD because I, I finished a few months ago. But uh, uh, one of the things I would like to do with those data is to look um, where the birds are going, from where colony they come from, and so that we can have an idea of which population uh, can also be the more at risk. You know. Uh, exactly. Um, yes. Yeah, because for for instance, uh, if we look. Um, if we look at the birds from the Barents Sea, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the common or the Brunish guillemots, and mostly the common guillemots, they mostly stay in the Barents Sea. And we see in the, in the present paper that the, the concentrations are not too high and are quite uh, similar between breeding and non-breeding period. At least it's higher during, during winter, but it's, it's not, the variation is not too big. But if we look at the birds from East Fjorden, so at the uh, west coast of, um, of Svalbards, those birds mostly go um, in the uh, off um, uh, in South Greenland and, and the east part of uh, Canada, and the concentration are not too big between um, 
uh, are not too high during breeding period, but they are really high during winter. And we know that those birds are, uh, are going there. And my idea here is, is therefore to look if uh, those pop how those populations are going, uh, are doing, and if the fact that they are going in certain area can be more at, at risk for, for, for those birds. Exactly. So, exactly. so you, you will be doing a toxic connectivity of migration. Um, okay. <laughs> so. like that. that is so cool. That is super cool. That's, that's a title right there. Toxic connectivity. <laughs> 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 no, that is uh, that is really that is a fantastic uh, idea. I mean, you can also uh, yes, as you also just said, you can just uh, then link uh, um, these differences uh, as uh, on the impacts on population uh, trajectories and what you were saying also in the paper on the effect of the uh, of the fitness of the individuals. And uh, yeah, so I, I was wondering also if you had um, uh, data or is uh, um, uh, on the on the list of uh, data to, to data sets to get uh, like also the uh, so the the, uh, the breeding success of the individuals but also of the um, 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 of the um, of the chick really I mean of course this is a very big huge question but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so within my PhD we didn't have access to those data because uh, um, so my PhD was within within a network that is called Artox that is uh, initiated by Jérôme Fort. I'm not sure he is connected, but uh, um, and uh, and at the beginning uh, we on, we only had data about uh, uh, the, the 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 individuals which individuals we had the mercury concentrations. Uh, sometimes we had access to the uh, body measurements. Uh, but for now, we don't have access to the breeding success, uh, the, the, the chic information. Uh, but I know that's, that's something that Jerome wanted to, to, to work on uh, at, uh, at some points, um, but we, not within, within my PhD. And we already had, I already had a huge data set to deal with. So that was okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, great. Um, I can uh, I can leave it to to you guys and to the to the audience. And uh, congratulations, Lynn, for your PhD. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Woohoo! Nice to get PhD <laughs> done and out of the way. Yeah, at least exactly. something had nice happened in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Considering it's been a miserable year. Uh, so I guess um, have have there been any studies, or have you thought about um, and following, this is kind of following the, the migration discussion and the uh, um, diet, diet discussion. Are there any species that you've looked at or you think that have been looked at that don't migrate very much, that are relatively local, that you could do a comparison on where you, you know, that would act as what I would think is a, as a good um, test for your, your hypothesis here as to whether or not it's migration driving this, uh, these differences in concentrations. Um, well, yes, if we get back to the, the idea I mentioned, um, is that, uh, for instance, we know that the birds from the Barents Sea mostly stay in the Barents Sea, but some others uh, migrate on the northwest uh, parts of, of uh, or southwest part of the, of the Atlantic. Um, and so basically one of the study of my PhD that is not published yet is that we, uh, with the, the, the colleagues from, from this sea uh, track uh, program, we basically made a map of the mercury contamination uh, on the North Atlantic. Yep. And we basically see that we have this huge difference with higher concentration on the West part compared to the East part. And it's really clear, the pattern is really clear that there is uh, this uh, uh, east-west uh, pattern that is already known because there are there are for, for instance in the map or in Jennifer's work or there are several papers that already mentioned that it might be in the Atlantic part an, 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 uh, a gradient in mercury. Um, what we did with this uh, GLS mercury study is that we basically mapped uh, mercury concentrations on the on the North Atlantic and a little bit of the Arctic parts. Oh, very cool. Mm. David, do you have any questions? 
Uh, I, th I think we should uh, ask uh, Joanna uh, whether she has questions. She put something in the chat, I think. I, I was about to, about to say that, Joanna. Hi, Joe. how are you? I'm fine. I, I'm glad to see everybody there and hope everybody stays safe and has a happy new year. Um, this was a great paper, and I always think it's really, really good when we get more data because we're never going to figure out the mercury patterns without that. Um, a couple of comments. I've actually looked at this migration connectivity and actually used that term um, because in species like red knots that breed in the subarctic and go to the southern tip of, of uh, South America, um, you get the same pattern that it's higher uh, coming from South America. Um, and what I've found is that feather, feathers are great and I've championed that for years, but you have to be very careful of exactly where you're taking the feathers from because their molt pattern differs in every species yeah. and, and it differs even within a species depending upon where they're migrating to. So in knots, for example, um, the ones that are only going to, to Southern uh, US and the Caribbean migrate in, in Massachusetts. The ones that are going to Cerro del Fuego don't, don't molt until they get to Cerro del Fuego. And so if you're taking breast feathers, there's a huge difference in terms of where and how they're molting as a, as a function of where they're, where they're going. And in common terms as well, um, you can get that difference. One trick if somebody is really interested in this and wants to work on it more is that in species that arrive on the breeding grounds and start nesting relatively soon, um, you can take breast feathers from birds and you're gonna get uh, mercury levels that were um, put in the feathers on the, on the wintering grounds. The feathers take about three weeks to grow back. So you can then get the feathers after they've um, got circu essentially circulating levels of mercury from local areas. And so you can compare in the same bird, uh, the two situations. When you do that, as we did that with common terns, you find that places like Boston Harbor, where everybody um, was sure that the, all of the contamination was coming from South America, it turned out that the birds put three times as much mercury in the feathers after they'd been in Boston Harbor than they did the ones that they grew in the, on, the, on the migration uh, wintering grounds. So there's a lot of, of nuances and I think it's great that you're starting to look at broad species and broad um, different patterns to try uh, to just see what that pattern is. I would just caution um, when you start looking at migration that you need to know the differences in where individuals are going because even from the same breeding group or colony, they can be going to different places and, and they might be molting at different places. But this is really wonderful and I commend you. Yeah, yeah. The, the thing with the feathers is that that's something I, I talked a lot during my, my PhD defense is that feathers are amazing when you know where the birds are molting, when the birds are molting. And a huge part of the first year of my PhD was to look at the molting pattern of uh, 20, 25 different Arctic seabirds uh, because we made this review of the literature, but also because I needed it for, 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 for my PhD. Um, and, uh, and once you know the molting pattern, you can manage to make migration versus uh, uh, mercury contamination. But it's really tricky and we really need to know well the, the, the molting pattern of your birds. Otherwise, it's easy to make mistakes on, on your interpretation and everything. So, yeah. And con conversely, uh, can uh, mercury contamination have an incidence on uh, molting patterns? Not to my knowledge. Or other contaminants? Mm. I'm just wondering. Yeah, just like that. No, I'm uh, not to my knowledge. I'm thinking I have not seen anything. But, uh, I've not seen anything in that in a lot of years. Yeah. All right. Um, we got a couple of questions in the chat. First, Daniel Turner has uh, has asked if you, uh, Celine, if you uh, would like some some samples from uh, from Northeast England. Um, and he's suggesting you chat. You can see it in the in the group chat there. Um, Tony, I assume that's Tony Gaston or Tony Don. I'm not sure which Tony it is. It's either Tony Gaston or Tony Diamond, one of the two. Uh, Tony Diamond. Like, oh, Tony. Hi, Tony. How are you doing? Well, thank you. Good. Tony, you can ask your question now that you're unmuted. Uh, 
What did I, oh yeah, I, I was first interested in the relative lengths of the breeding and wintering periods, um, comparing things like puffins, for example, with say mers or razorbills, the breeding period is a lot longer in the puffins than um, in the mers or razorbills because they don't have this, this uh, intermediate fledging strategy. So I, I and, and the only reason I mention it is it must, it must affect the, the length of time well, for which the, the bird is exposed to those contaminants, right? If, if, if you've got a short breeding period, then you, you, the feathers that are molted during the winter, or, or rather the, the feathers that are molted in the spring, the pre-breeding head mold, there's been a lot longer time to accumulate mercury. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um... So that's why in the paper we talk about periods and we made like some rough uh, idea of which period we are looking at. Um, uh, because we had colonies from uh, low Arctic to high Arctic also. So no, not, I think not, there are many, many colonies that don't have the same um, lengths of breeding and non-breeding periods and the different species also. Um, so that's why we talk really in this paper, at least we really, really talk about periods. Uh, if I had to look for each colony uh, and each species, the time of the breeding and non-breeding period, I think I will not have finished my PhD yet. And also <laughs> because the information are not yeah. sometimes available. And for the puffin, for instance, we did not use the Atlantic puffin. We did not use them for this study. We use them for the other study, but not for this one. Also because the uh, molting pattern during the, uh, after the breeding season is much more complicated than for Indeed. the other alcids. So we decided not to use these species for, for, this, uh, for, the, the, for this study because of that. But is it not the case that tufted puffin and rhinoceros auklet also have a protracted breeding period compared with mers and those you did have? Mm, I don't remember. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Hmm. Anyway, fascinating paper. And, and I, I also um, uh, support Joanna's point about you need to be very careful which feathers you take. Yeah. But evidently you're very well acquainted with that. So yeah. yeah, yeah. But thanks for a great paper. Thanks, Tony. Um, we do have another question in here from Wayne Humphreys. Yes, that is <laughs> that is a relation of mine. Uh, <laughs> he's asked, given the higher mercury levels uh, with winter seabirds, are there increased risks for human consumption during the winter seabird hunt off of Newfoundland, especially because eiders and murres are most commonly hunted off the island? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Well, the... Uh, if we talk about the eiders, they are uh, within all of the species that we have within Artox, they are the species that are the least uh, contaminated, uh, accepted, accepted for some, some birds in, in Iceland, for what I remember. Um, but so no, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely the thing, uh, um, yeah, for, it's a problem for, you, for, for humans, that's for sure. But I'm thinking about the birds that are spending winter uh, in Canada and, and I mean close to Canada in Greenland um, in winter because the, the thing is that um, mercury is excreted into the phasers. So once mercury is excreted, it's like 70 to 90 percent of the mercury burden that, that is in the phasers. So basically it's a mean to to um, to 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 how how you say that to to detox yeah to be less less toxic or I right. don't know how so, to say so, that. so the, mer for the mercury isn't in the muscle you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily be ingesting the mercury the mer because the mercury is contained in the feathers yeah, yeah, it, yeah it is though it is though in the birds that we analyzed from the Aleutian Islands in eiders mm -hmm. the mercury yeah. levels were above what you would want people to be okay. eating and the mercury in the eggs of the eiders that, pe that the Aleuts were eating was higher than, than consumption levels, acceptable consumption yeah. levels. That's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
No, but uh, and also because for what I remember, for for most of these birds, we also have blood sample and we have a strong relation between the blood and the and the the feathers sample too. So, uh, so yeah, but no, yeah, basically for the birds on the west part of the Atlantic, there might be a, a problem for 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 health, human health. That's uh, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, Hamza has asked the question. He has said. Uh, did you analyze any other heavy metals like zinc or cadmium? Uh, were there any intercorrelation intercorrelations between them? So no, we did not. Uh, Artox is really focused on on, on mercury, um, and at this scale, because I think now we have like the data set is like. 10,000 uh, lines. So it's really huge uh, data set that we have within this, this program. And uh, having, analyzing other elements uh, would, uh, that, that would be much more funding first and, and time also, because uh, it's not the same amount of time you spend when you analyze mercury or when you analyze other, uh, other elements. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Celine. Um, David or Mary. Oh, wait. Oh, Hamza has a question for you, Joanna. She he says a question to Joanna. Can we use wing feathers for trace metal studies in terns? Um, yes, but you have to know exactly what the molt pattern is, and the molt pattern is going to be different different places and different colonies, different times of the year. So I find wing feathers are much harder to use in the way that we're using it to look at migration. It's easier to predict breast feathers, um, what, what is happening to them. Yeah, he, he then says from chicks as well. Uh, chicks, we use, we often use chicks because um, that's ind indicative of local exposure. We don't take their wing and, feathers. But we don't usually take their wing feathers because obviously you don't want to do that. If you take breast feathers, it takes two or three weeks to grow back. Yeah. So if you're taking a small pinch of breast feathers from fledglings, you're not in any way harming um, their learning to fly or migration or any of their behavior. Um, that's another reason to take breast feathers rather than to take wing feathers. People traditionally took wing feathers because they had dead birds. Uh, yeah, gotcha. Hmm. Very cool. This, right. was really, this was a really neat discussion. I enjoyed this. <laughs> thanks, Joe. Thanks for, thanks for joining in as usual. And thanks, Celine. David or, or Mariana, do you have any more questions before we shut her down? I I'm good. All right, David, you don't you don't seem very like very enthusiastic about asking any more questions. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just uh, I just wanted to leave the floor because I I knew that on the scene there were very uh, knowledgeable people. Uh, uh, specifically on that uh, on that topic, so um, yeah. I, I, wa I wanted them to have a uh, lot of time. Maybe a final one, uh, Celine. You you worked with a very uh, large team of authors, um, uh, and I, I was wondering whether you had any advice to uh, to fellow uh, young investigators in in you know the best ways to to deal with that many people uh, for a PhD paper. Oh, uh... <laughs> you, can, uh, you can you can keep it short. You can keep it short. Hardest <laughs> question session right there. <laughs> but I also had this question. I am really interested, so I am listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, um, uh, I I don't know where even where to start. Uh, no, I think the main thing was really being well organized because I think at some point I had fifteen different documents at the same times when I was sending the, the, the paper to the co-authors, to the review and everything. Um, so yeah, just a very good organization to, to, to have everything reg well registered, who did what, where, uh, and, and everything. Because uh, yeah, I think on this paper, we are 48 co-authors. Uh, I think in total in my PhD, there are 70 co-authors. So, so yes, we need organization <laughs> to be sure that everything is, is yeah, well organized and 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 have proper deadlines all the time because uh, because yeah. when you have fifty quarters, you have to be sure that you have a proper deadline and and send remainder all the time to be sure that you have the the, the, the info you need because otherwise it's it never ends. So. <laughs> 
I think uh, I think the key point is is uh, to uh, to really avoid sending uh, general emails to uh, to fifty people and uh, and really write to people in person to to make sure things happen. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, well done for that, Celine. Yes, that's, uh, yes, that's quite a quite an effort. All right, with that, I'm going to stop recording.